So on today's podcast, uh, I'm speaking with Johan Malawano. Uh, Johan is the head and founder of uh, the Healthcare Leadership Academy uh, and Medics Academy, which are organizations which are trying to empower the next generation of healthcare leaders. Johan, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Zach. How are you? I'm doing okay. And how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. So I've been wanting to interview you for a long time, uh, not just because I've gone through the Healthcare Leadership Academy and, and it was what started this podcast, but also I first learned about you during the junior doctor's strike. Um, and, you know, I think m maybe people will remember seeing you on their TVs as the sort of face of the, the BMA campaign at that time. Uh, and I just wondered, you know, what was what impact did that have on you uh, being the center of attention at quite what was quite a dramatic time? Um, so it was obviously quite a uh, it was quite a intense period in my life. It was uh, 11 months I did that role for. Uh, however, I'd been involved with um, with the BMA off and on since being a medical student back in 2003, um, mainly, actually, a lot of the time taking on roles, doing them, and then often uh, leaving and going off and doing other things in my career, other kind of medical things. So I wasn't your traditional kind of BMA rep in some ways in that I, I don't spend, I didn't spend the periods in between the times when I did roles um, kind of sitting on the committee, um, mainly because I, I have to say I'm, I'm much more focused on the, rather than the politics of the organization, which I'm, you know, let's be clear, I'm very interested in politics generally. Um, otherwise you wouldn't get involved in these things, but, um, but more to do with the actual execution. How do you get something done? And so when I wasn't uh, involved with the BMA, I would often go off and I'd be doing my own thing, but I also support the organization from the, from very much either outside or from the back benches to try and knowing what the leadership has to go through when you're, when you're in a leadership leadership role and so that was that was my experience and involved with the BMA I, I kind of was involved as a student to in a very relatively uh, you know low level role I was I was the deputy chair of the National Medical Students Committee um, but it wasn't there wasn't much activity going on at the time um, mm -hmm. nothing dramatic and so uh, we were we were entering into a period where we were uh, we were discussing the issues around postgraduate training particularly around the foundation program so it was the period just before the foundation program first launched um, but the rollout of the foundation program was fairly uneventful in 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 most terms it was in back in 2004 2005 mm. um where the bma really kind of came to the fore in my mind was is, was around in 2007 2008 when uh, something called uh, modernizing medical careers was really kind of in its in its um in its uh impact um and there was a a, a application system the first fully national computerized digital application system called uh, uh, the medical training application service or system i think mm -hmm. mtas and uh, i was part of the group of doctors that were first applying through that and it, it became a bit of a, a of a mess um mainly from the digital perspective from from the technology perspective the actual underpinning oh yeah, from the underpinning scenario, it was actually a fairly, you know, it was a fairly robust thing. It was, a, it was the idea was a national system that could, that was transparent mm -hmm. and was less based on local kind of relationships mm -hmm. and, you know, just happening to be there and working for the person that would then appoint the role and all this kind of stuff. And it went to a much more points based, transparent system. Now, Subsequently, have we gone too far with the whole points thing and, and you know, everyone fixating on these national uh, systems? Uh, maybe. But the reality was uh, back then mm. it was it was at one. Uh, it was at a different extreme where it was very yeah. much very opaque how people would be appointed to very prestigious roles. And so that's how I first got involved. The BMA all blew up. And, and for those of your listeners who uh, were probably quite young at the time or did not weren't really aware of the uh, of yeah. the medical <laughs> environment. Um, it was it was something that the then Secretary of State Patricia Hewitt kind of lost her job over actually, and the head of the BMA lost yeah. his job over it. So it was a real mess. And I took over uh, subsequently of the, the education and training portfolio. So I negotiated a lot of aspects of the education environment in the UK, um, the, the 
the the the thing that I think most mm-hmm. people will remember from that period that I was uh, that I, I brought in was the inter new transfer system, which didn't exist prior to that. Yeah, I've got I've got friends that have that have used that the, themselves. The yeah. the kind of thing that I so you know you've been involved in in sort of all these negotiations behind the scenes, sort of plugging away at trying to improve the system, and then I get the the sense that like. The junior doctors strike was just something that the BMA totally weren't expecting to happen. And, uh, you know, the whole sort of uh, machinery of the government now, you know, engaged in a campaign against junior doctors. Um, And, you know, in that kind of scenario, you've got to make compromises in terms of the contract. And, you know, I was thinking, do you sort of looking back now, do you think that actually what you achieved was kind of was a good compromise for for junior doctors be really interested to hear what what your thoughts are about that yeah totally i mean i i i think um i i'm very proud of actually everything we achieved during that period uh, the 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 junior doctors contract from 2016 is a is a step change frankly from what came before we've got uh you know many of the of the doctors wanted things like education mm. uh recognized within their co- contractual rights they wanted things like um the ability to uh, to raise concerns you know protections for that in their contract but and they also wanted to be paid for the time they actually worked um which again looking back is quite a is quite a big uh kind of conceptual change from the previous mm. contract um and would put us in line and, with yeah. with with consultants and gps because uh consultants and gps were always paid for the time they worked uh whereas uh junior doctors were were told that you know professionally professionally it's not appropriate to be paid for the time you work whereas now you know there was a serious change that now the, the whole contract itself uh, was a huge I mean it's a huge uh, problem in that it's or, or huge comp, uh, it's got a huge amount of complexity because it's 56 mm. specialties uh, plus now uh, over a 24 hour clock but with huge amounts of responsibility in the moment right so whereas in lots of you know lots of other professions across the public sector they're very fixed you know you 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 tend to have fixed hours when the majority mm. of activity happens uh, whether that's you know eight to five or eight to six or nine to five or whatever it is um but with junior doctors because of the nature of the variety of different um roles what you end up with is very complex mathematical problems right where you've got the you've got people that are doing transplant surgery on the same contracts as people doing lab specialties or uh, primary care specialties or community yeah, people don't don't realize that you're a junior doctor all the way up until you become a consultant you know mm. and technically and you know people don't realize and, and you're, that you're the, and, and importantly you're the frontline member of staff you're the you're the you know you're the person who has to actually physically be in the hospital which means mm. that actually that has other contractual implications which then has problems with trying to apply uh, kind of uh, frameworks and 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 frankly mathematics to the problem and and i was very fortunate and i worked with some very very smart people from uh, mm. who were doctors who were junior doctors it from uh, from predominantly from cambridge who basically had to solve this complicated mathematical issue whilst the, whilst we i also had to coordinate a campaign plus i had to work yeah. with our our kind of legal teams and everything else to work out the contractual frameworks but ultimately the the reason i went in and did this it was that i basically uh, the bma asked me to come and do this role to try and solve a problem where they were at loggerheads with the government um uh, for the previous three years and there was there didn't look yeah. like there was much movement <laughs> possible um and so what my my job was was to find a, a negotiated settlement between the two parties um and to negotiate the best possible uh, uh, agreement on behalf of clinicians that that met the kind of overarching aims mm-hmm. they had. Now, whether you can ma- whether you can maximise every single outcome is is a is a question because you ultimately you know as an organisation as the BMA but also as doctors we're going to continuously be working within the NHS and with the NHS for the rest of our careers. Um, and so yeah. you you can't afford to therefore burn every single bridge in an attempt to just simply score a political victory. What you're really trying to do is find a settlement that lands and sticks mm-hmm. the test of time. And that's what we did. And, you know, in 2018, I think there was a survey that asked 
doctors what they thought of the contract in comparison once they'd actually gone through it and 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 used it and i think over 80% had had said that they basically um they thought that it was a huge it was an improvement on the on the previous contract yeah. and that my job was really to come in and think rethink the framework because the problem was up till 2016 until until 2015 when i i i took over what the two sides were doing was trying to tinker with the current contract with the then current contract and they were clearly not going to get anywhere that way because they were, the the positions had had locked mm. so much they were so intransigent and so what i came in to do was really to find a solution like, and what i did was to, to yeah, redesign the again. system yeah, yeah. Uh, you did, i mean that wasn't the, the the thing that they asked me to do but that was ultimately the judgment call awesome. i made yeah. which was basically the only way to solve this problem which was to basically to start from mm. a from a uh, from a fresh piece of paper and say look what are the outcomes that we all want to achieve and that we can sign up to both the government side and the the profession side and actually achieve and that's and that's ultimately what we did we came with some completely mm. fresh proposals um and we tried to solve that problem and i think actually what we did was succeed in that in that um in that goal because that contract has stood the test of time and ultimately you can you know you can moan you can argue you can cajole you can say uh, what you want but the fact it stands is the real is the real uh, kind of demonstration I mean, that, that really resonates with me you know because a big part of what led me to set up this podcast was that you know actually these issues should not be about scoring political points or about party political interests it should be you know how do we actually make a stable system that 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 works better and i wonder you know because after after that had resolved i think uh, at that time you you didn't continue working with the bme but actually stepped out to, to found Medics Academy and the Healthcare Leadership Academy. I wonder, was there, did you feel adequately prepared by your career up until then to, you know, were you equipped with the leadership skills to take on that, that contract negotiation? Because I wonder if part of the reason why you, why you set up these things was because actually you felt like, you know, we could equip doctors, healthcare professionals much better. So I, I was in a quite privileged position. I, I had held leadership roles up till that point for the previous, like, 15 years almost right so mm. I, I i mean i was I, I, and i'd already run a national negotiation process uh, once before with the between the bma and and kind of very you weren't a spring but, chicken then yeah i don't think in any st in any stretch of the imagination was i a uh, was a was a, a, a junior doctor that just had walked in off the street as it were and yeah. so and, and i'd also sat on national boards by that stage mm. i was on the gmc for four years as in my own right as a as a council member as a board member i'd sat on the board of the postgraduate medical education and training board for two years i was one of only two board members that oversaw the merger of the two organizations so i i kind of knew how uh, both how to how the system worked which is important but also how to to affect change within the system and and i the main thing about my career was that i i, I wasn't that bothered about a, a, the a polit the political career right so i wasn't really that focused on being a politician or getting involved with medical politics i i very much went into these roles to try and work out how to affect change to the system in a positive direction in the same way with the interdisciplinary transfer policy i i often went in when i wanted to actually achieve something and work out how to achieve it and I think that was one thing that was important so when it came to setting up the the HLA and Medics Academy what I really wanted to work out was I was very fortunate to have a lot of privilege in my life right I was supported very well in my medical school career I I ended up I, I come from an ordinary background I come I was an immigrant I held a, I hold a Sri Lankan passport still actually and I uh, as well as a British one um I, um, you know, I came, I was born in another country. I lived in, in both Sri Lanka and Nigeria before coming to the UK. I went to a public, wow. uh, a, 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 a kind of, um, what do you call the state school, uh, a, a grammar school in Northeast London. So I, I came from a normal background. However, I uh, effectively, oh, I suppose normal in the context of, uh, or is, 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 uh, is probably not, not that normal, not actually. Not privileged. You, you weren't a yeah, Boris not... Johnson going yeah. to Eton, is what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go to Eton. So, uh, so I, I was very lucky. And I went to my <laughs> local medical school. I went to parts of the London, which was, 
20 minutes from my parents' house. You know, it was, it was, I, I lived, I led a fairly normal life. But what I did have at medical school was a huge amount of privilege in social privilege, right? So I was president of my medical school. And whatever you think about, um, about these, about medical school and these roles, ultimately, um, medical when you're when you're elected into those kind of roles people don't go through a competency framework to know whether you're any good at your job it is a popularity contest right and the the ultimately i was lucky in that i could get elected to those things which meant actually in medicine that is the biggest privilege you can have which is the support of your colleagues of your friends of your uh, of the people who are in in uh, responsible roles etc and when i came out of medical school i was very fortunate to have lots of mentors lots of support lots of people who were help, who would be willing to talk to me and then as i went through my career doors would open for me that were not necessarily open to other people um and yeah. so what i ended up with is it, what i ended up was and, and they opened, let's be clear, because previous roles I'd done relatively well at them. I'd, I'd you know, I delivered what I said I'd deliver. I'd, I'd uh, innovated. I'd thought differently about a problem. I'd tried my best. I'd always stood up for what I believed in. Um, and because of that, people, even when people are on the other side of the argument sometimes, they end up respecting your opinion. They respect what you're trying to achieve, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, and so what I ended up with was a huge amount of privilege in my career where I was given opportunities because of the work I'd done previously. And so and through that... It sounds that, like I, the, the Healthcare Leadership Academy was about trying to give that privilege to other people that didn't necessarily... Exactly have it yeah, yeah. Um, and i i saw i saw a lot of clinicians that were very unhappy in their roles right and mm -hmm. often it wasn't because of a lack of talent it was a lack of opportunity there was a lack of they they got to doors that were closed to them and actually they could very very they were very capable and they were perfectly adequate to go through those doors and unlike in my case, where I had that opportunity, other people didn't. And the HLA was really about giving people those opportunities, giving a wider group of people the opportunities I was privileged to have, and also yeah. preparing them for those roles, right? So trying to guide them to improve them to try and give them a safe space to develop their ideas so that they can then be successful in those opportunities when they came about. Mm -hmm. And I suppose what that means is that having those opportunities and being able to you know succeed as, as you say it's not just about what your skills are or how competent you are for the job it's also about this ability to create opportunities um, to to know people to create be putting yourself out there um i think ali abdal talks about this a lot about putting work into trying to create serendipity for yourself so if you put um you know if you create content somebody might like that and that might lead to a conversation and so the more that you put out content the more you're making yourself open to those opportunities to come along in future uh, would you say that that's that that's right that's like a fundamental part of what makes somebody able to take on board those opportunities yeah, I mean, completely. I think the um, in in this in the current generation of clinicians, um, the ability to go out. I mean, you, as you say, d d build content. You've got it's even more. Uh, there's even more freedom for young clinicians to to develop their their skills and their their. Uh, their opportunities than there were when I came out of medical school, certainly. And one of the things I often talk about in uh, some of the the programs I run in the HLA, because I I, I I speak uh, both in the HLA and Medics Academy, we run a huge medical education program now in in Medics Academy, and. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is actually how do uh, medical educators get themselves out there and how do they improve their 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 profile? Do they go through the traditional route of working in a medical school or working in a postgraduate deanery or working in royal colleges? Or, or how do they pair that with the, the, the modern world of communicating directly with a huge audiences? And so we often do a lot of training in this space for um, not just younger clinicians who are coming through who already recognize this but often for much more senior clinicians who mm -hmm. suddenly realize that the world is moving on and the traditional 
you know, frameworks, the, the Royal Colleges, the medical schools, the, the universities, the postgraduate deaneries. These are not the way that you communicate with, with huge, you know, with, as a medical educator anymore. I mean, Ali Abdal is a great yeah. example of this. You know, he, if I think about, if you were, if you were a lecturer at Barts in the London, my old school, basically, if you were a lecturer at Barts in the London, you may get to speak to 240 medical students every year in a lecture or two lectures, or if you ran a, a module, right? So there were 240 young clinicians you get to speak to, and there are about 1500 students across the whole school. So you would, in a privileged position, in an ivory tower of a, of a UK medical school, you would get to speak to that many people. I look at Ali Abdal's YouTube page. He's got 2.2 million uh, subscribers the last time I looked. He's speaking to probably the entire population of Barts in London for its entire existence, right? And so, um, and, and you know, he's doing that in every video. So the ability to, if, you're, if your main t- goal in life is to be an educator, to educate people, to help people, to, to add value to their lives, then you could argue, you know, what is what is a greater impact? The uh, being a, a, a lecturer to, at a, a ivory tower institution, or building the kind of audience that Ali has built up that lets him communicate with this wide mm-hmm. audience. And, and I, I, we talk about this a lot in in the programs we run in Medics Academy, which is to say, well, look, you know, ultimately think about what it is you want to achieve. Do you want to educate people because you care about education, mm-hmm. or do you want to have a position that has authority? Um, And sometimes those two things are intrinsically linked. You know, you could, I I doubt anyone would uh, would dismiss something Ali said and would dismiss uh, a senior professor of medical education. I think they're, now they've got to a fairly comparable status, I would argue, because yeah, actually it's just as that, hard. It? Yeah. yeah, it's just as hard to do. In fact, it's probably much harder to do what Ali has done than it is to do uh, to essentially go through the traditional route of getting up to being a professor, because ultimately there is a well-trodden path. So I think I think in in me- so medical education is the area that I've, I you know I, I was always interested in. I was the uh, deputy chair for education at the BMA as a medical student. So education was, and I was involved with Jasmine and all this stuff. But medical education was always the area that I was interested in. And and actually, as I came out of the time being involved with the junior doctors and stuff, I realised that this was this was my career this was the rest of my life i'd already been he- like really interested in technology since the kind of mid noughties um and pretty much in the late noughties, so, you know, 2008, 2009, I started really reading up and getting in, getting interested in technology, doing lots of uh, interesting things that I thought were, you know, just trying to understand where the world was going. And I'd actually been involved with um, thinking about um, how you would use technology in fields outside of medicine prior to, to all of that stuff when I was doing research at Imperial. And what came, um, this was um, in, in the, uh, like from 2010 to 2014. And what I realized when I came out of the junior doctor's role was that I saw that often organizations outside of the system had a huge ability to innovate and impact the system in a positive mm-hmm. way. But it took real grit and determination to go and do that. And and I want and I kind of thought about this and I thought, you know what, what do I want to do? I had a fairly stable and, and actually quite despite all the all of the kind of arguments and the and the heat in that in that um in that process, I had a fairly, you know, good career i was a senior registrar i was uh, you know I, I um i i worked in teaching hospitals i you know clinically i was fine otherwise you'd have heard about it i'm sure in the in the newspapers um but the 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 reality uh, the reality was that basically you could work your way up the system. You could end up as the president of a Royal College. You could end up as the head of the BMA. You could end up as a dean. You could you know, pick your career path. But ultimately, you're still within a system that is so needing innovation and, on, and kind of a yeah. change to it. And the best yeah. way I thought I could do that was from outside that system. And so what I did was you I put went... the dilemmas and- that people are facing so well... Um- and uh, and I think that uh, it's worth examining those for a little bit. Like one is the dilemma: Do you stay in this sort of set career pathway, which is yes, very stable, yes, you know, very uh, very good, but comes with the cost of you've got to stay in that system, and and that system doesn't change very fast. Or do you step outside of it? And I think that um, a lot of early career health professionals are looking at 
you know, people like Ali Abdal with his YouTube channel. They're looking to organizations like the Healthcare Leadership Academy. And they're saying, actually, I want to spend my career making a bit more of a difference than I'm getting to do in my job currently. It's quite an odd economic behavior, don't you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say just be really certain of what you do. I mean, the, the, there's there are safe ways of doing this and there are risky ways of doing this. I, I mean, I, I'll i be honest, I did probably the most risky way of doing this. So I I, uh, I am very fortunate in that I have a, an incredibly supportive family and wife. I had young kids at the time, um, but my wife was very supportive of what I did. And so um, we ended up in, in, in to get the company to get Medics Academy off the ground and the HLA, um, I ended up uh, leaving uh, a stable career. Uh, I didn't I have a salary for three years. We ended up selling uh, our house to to start the organisation. Um, oh, wow. We, you know, we put that's, everything that into stressful. Yeah, we put everything into it. I mean, we and because I, I was very clear what I wanted to achieve and how I wanted to go about doing it, and I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it in a way that I I could really. Uh, ensure that the 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 ideas I had really get, got a chance to to be fully explored, and we didn't get much. You know, we had no real. We had some support. We had lots of support from young clinicians who come came and joined the programs and and got involved with the system and and did some you know did some work and all of this kind of stuff. But the fundamentally, we didn't have the safety net of the NHS or the safety net of a Royal College or the safety net of a, of the BMA there to kind of ensure that we were successful. What we had to do was really, you know, to to work out the problems ourselves and and build a organ an organisation that that's that's you know successful. And now Medics Academy has over forty staff across four continents. We uh, the HLA has over a hundred faculty, I think, across the world. Um, you know, both of the organisations. The HLA is a, a, a not for profit social enterprise that that is really an education institution that's supporting clinicians going through this leadership journey we have over 500 scholars now um medics academy is building education uh, programs for institutions we've mm -hmm. worked for over uh, we work in partnership with over 40 nhs trusts we work with um Health Education England regions. We've worked for the WHO. Uh, we work with ministries of health mm -hmm. across the world. So we've kind of built um, we've built uh, an organisation to build education programmes that can then be that mm -hmm. can use the knowledge and skills of Western Europe and the US and leverage that into projects we believe in. So, for instance, we off our own balance sheet, we we uh, basically uh, have invested a quarter of a million pounds worth of resources in building uh, gender empowerment program in Ethiopia with the Ethiopian Medical Women's Association. We've built, we're building a program with the Indian Confederation of Health Accreditation mm -hmm. in India to support Indian uh, clinicians start their leadership journey, which they approached us and said was really important from uh, due to yeah. the COVID crisis in India. So we've tried to, and, and, and that came about because of the relationships I had previously where the previous uh, BAPIO president, the uh, British uh, uh, British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Got to get, make sure I get the uh, the acronym right. Um, uh, the, pre <laughs> the former president approached me and said, "You know, look, is there anything you can do to help uh, Indian physicians? Because actually, we've got you know, th there's a huge crisis there, and, and you know, you guys do some really interesting work, and I think you could help them. And so we we again we put our own resources. We didn't go out. We didn't raise money. We didn't go and get mm. uh, grants or anything like that. We we decided we were going to do this. We were going to put our resources behind." this and the the freedom that i have now in this role is very much that i can decide what we uh, what well i say i it's not me it's me and my team can decide what we're going to invest in as a group and say yeah. okay well let's let's support female empower, gender empowerment in in ethiopia let's support um indian physicians uh, trying to start their leadership journey and so mm -hmm. that's the 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 kind of the ability that we've developed and that's what we really wanted to do over the last five years and I think people are going to listen to that and they're going to say, well, you know, that sounds absolutely great. That sounds like something I could never do just if I focus on just climbing the career ladder within the NHS, even though that that's a nice, stable job. I wonder that, you know, hundreds of people are involved in the Healthcare Leadership Academy now. And, and like you say, the Medics Academy is, is international. And I'm wondering, what is it that people are seeing 
uh, that's making uh, them invest their time uh, into into doing those projects? What's what's in it for them? Because I think that you know you've really hit on a niche here that people want to be involved in these kinds of bigger projects, and they're not getting to do that in their normal jobs. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that we um, we try and do is we are very much, you know, we have a view and a vision of, of the world that we want to see. We want to see a massive improvement in the in the amount of uh, trained healthcare professionals out there. We want to actually impact the world in a positive way. There are currently 1.55 physicians per thousand uh, people across the globe, but that that number is massively skewed. It's it's really not distributed evenly, as as I'm sure everyone knows. So in the UK, we have about 2.78, I think, physicians per 1,000. But in Ethiopia, there's less than 0.1 physicians per 1,000 population, right? In in the second most populous country in Africa, 100 million people. What do you do about that? Now, why do people come and join the organisation? Or why do people get involved with it? Well, for often they get involved with it for their own reasons. So they, you know, we we run one of the largest education programs in the country. So in terms of the in terms of medical education, we have uh, we have a, a PG cert that we do with the University of Central uh, Lancashire. We have our training and teaching program. We have uh, uh, fellowship programs. We work we do work with the NHS on um, in terms of NHS trusts. You know, we've got huge uh, medical education programs that really try and talk to the needs of clinicians in the, in the UK in their career development but what we do yeah. through that is we leverage that resource so you you come and do a medics academy program usually you know because you also have through those programs you will have access to do projects in the the footprint we have so you know as you know from when your time in the hla hla scholars they they can not only do projects in their own local trust where they may do a quality improvement project or something like that but they can they can instead opt to do projects internationally they can come and work on projects we've done with the who they can come and work on projects we do internationally with with uh, the cha- uh, in the charity sector we, they can you know there's a lot of opportunities directly into this stuff yeah. and we facilitate that and one of the things that i'm very very keen on because it was my career was I was given a lot of opportunities to have responsibility early on, right? I didn't have, I didn't, I wasn't sitting there as this assistant to someone or the fellow to someone. I was the one who had to go and do the thing. And and I was responsible. I was the one speaking. I was the one in the leadership role. And what I try and do in, in both the HLA and Medics Academy is we try and give clinicians that type of opportunity, not the assistant, not the second person, not the person sitting, not at the table, back somewhere. We put them in charge. We put, we give them the freedom to go and do something and say, look, here are your objectives and key results. Here's what you have to achieve. Here are some resources, often not many because we don't have many, but you try and see what you can do. And what the, what the interesting thing I found is that we've got now 10, I think 10 clinicians that work in Medics Academy on, on the payroll in, in part-time, part-time roles. And the reality is if you give clinicians a chance, a you know, actual opportunity to make a difference, they will go and make a difference. They will do stuff mm-hmm. that is impressive, right? And so what we try and do through the programs is, first of all, people come and they may get involved with the education program they may get involved with the leadership program they may get involved with one you know we have where we've got a digital program that's coming that's about to be launched we they get involved with various different things but through that they get involved with the community and they see the culture mm. they see the ethos they see this kind of very international community of people that have very very a very strong ethical focus on what we're trying to achieve mm. and one of the things that I'm very, very clear on with people is that we Medics Academy is a commercial company. It's a it's a technology company, a for profit technology company. But for profit is in in itself not a dirty word. I know in medicine we sometimes think it is, but you can use the resources. It's it's our choice to use those resources that we generate in order to promote ideals that we believe in. So mm-hmm. we use the resources off our balance sheet to 
to invest in things like uh, uh, gender empowerment in Ethiopia or leadership in India or pick your different project that we try and invest in. We, when we first started, we did a lot of work with street doctors on uh, on kind of uh, on uh, on gang violence and trauma. We we put a lot of resources into that off our own in, in, from ourselves to try and help that organization. And that organization has gone on to do amazing things. Yeah. The other thing that we've invested heavily in is is HLA ideas, right? The uh, the idea that we can build. Uh, support the building of not-for-profit and social enterprises, charities in the mm-hmm. in the UK first of all, and then globally that support healthcare pro- uh, ideas. So we've got sixteen organisations now in HLA ideas that includes Melanin Medics or TAMS or you know there's loads of them that I, I, I can't. I'm not. I'm going to now fail, fail by not being able to name them. But <laughs> the good reason I can separate those two out is that we've just we gave them awards. So both TAMS and Melanin Medics, we gave them both financial support we gave them actual money but we also gave them a huge amount of other support to kind of help them grow as organizations and that's again something that we can afford to do now that we're we're able to build these education programs so why do people do this zach you asked that well Mm. if you come and do a program in medics academy you know that part of that money that you're spending in in the uk is probably going to go and help support a project in ethiopia or a project in africa or yeah. even a charity in in the uk and so we we have the ability to decide that kind of route as it were mm-hmm. it's it's an interesting trend as well because you know you said the technology is changing um you've also kind of said about the private sector and the sort of dirtiness of the word profit and i've been thinking about that quite a lot and i think what people are really against is not profit but it's about profiteering that they're against so if people are using that profit just to, for their own personal wealth i think that's when people have a problem with it but or if you're using profit to reinvest because you want to make this developmental or educational program stable well I think the the world is going much more in that direction, whether we like it or not. And uh, precisely for the reason that you said that the public sector is not innovating as fast as the private sector is in this space. So if you want to be doing something, well, you're going to need to get funding from somewhere. You're going to need to come up with that funding stream yourself. I think that it's also a good sign that you can't, um, that, you know, if there's too many projects going on that you can't remember all the names of them, that's that's a really good sign, isn't it? <laughs> because it means that people are are coming to be involved uh, and, and kind of trusting the Healthcare Leadership Academy with that, um, with the long-term sustainability of that project, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I think we are very, very, very fortunate, right? We get a lot of people inbound uh, uh, kind of inquiries to work with us, and mm-hmm. uh, we haven't. We 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 do do some outbound work, you know, going reaching out to things that we're interested in, but. To be fair, we were so usually so overwhelmed with the things coming in that basically mm. we we tend to we tend to stick to what we're getting, as it were. Um, I think yeah. that will change as the team grows. Um, the team has doubled in size in the last year, and so that part must of have that, brought its own challenges about the growth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, both in the HLA actually and in Medics Academy. So the staff team in the in Medics Academy has doubled in size in the last year during the pandemic. The in the HLA, um, you know, as you know, Zach, the 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 kind of the base of uh, of the HLA is is all is is mostly people who have done the program and then want to give something back because and, and that's important to me is that basically we try we recruit in the HLA from our scholars right so if for, for the faculty and for various other things we obviously people that are very talented that come from that have reached done something really interesting from outside we will we'll often talk to them they may become mentors or something like that but the the core of the HLA there are about 50 uh, faculty members that are the, really the core of the HLA they are cohort directors they're mentors they're they lead different bits of the organization they predominantly in fact i think they all come from within the the scholar uh, kind of uh, the the scholar alumni and that's an active choice we get a lot of um, mm-hmm. qu- inquiries about people saying oh you know i'd like to become a faculty member etc cetera, etc cetera. but we're very clear that we've trained our own people we've we focused on the development of our own scholars and when they if if there is a choice between one of our scholars who we've spent time with and we've nurtured and we've encouraged who 
understand what it is we're doing and why we're doing it and and really really have and i probably say this in the wrong way but have drunk the kool-aid of what we're trying to achieve then yeah. we would r- much rather invest in them than invest mm-hmm. in, in in and because we know them right and so we basically we have a very clear view that um that you know, it. We have an incredibly vibrant community. Now, if that community wasn't as vibrant, or wasn't as talented, or wasn't achieving all the things that our community are achieving, then you could probably argue, well, you know, you should open it up, and you, you know, why it's a very uniform view. We have, as as you know, Zach, we have an incredibly diverse community, right? They come from all over the world. They come from incredible socioeconomic backgrounds. They they yeah. come from different religious groups, different ideas, different, you know, every, the, the, the HLA scholars are some of the most interesting and diverse, talented people. So I don't in any way uh, shy away from the fact that because we've got this incredibly diverse pool of talent, we should harness it and use it to promote the ideas that we've got which are supporting other professionals going through their leadership journey and that's what we do so we try and make it a self-perpetuating um kind of uh, organization where people that really really care about what we do because they've been part of it and they've benefited from it that's the other thing that what we're really seeing and this is the real value is that many of the scholars that go through our programs they're getting into roles after the program that they probably wouldn't necessarily get into as fast as if they had not gone through the program. So it's not that they necessarily wouldn't get there because let's face it, we're picking the most talented young people or not, you know, people in the healthcare fields, they're going to succeed no matter what happens, right? If you, you know, the, the, the kind of Oxbridge scenario where you go to Oxbridge, is it what Oxbridge did to you? Or is it the fact that you just happened to get selected into a very selective organization? Well, I, you can fairly I, I'm guarantee. I'm on the selection side of that yeah. argument. I think it's all yeah. selection. Once you select them, <laughs> once you select them, I mean, they're going to, you know, those people are going to succeed no matter what you do. And the reality is that if they then, then, um, so, so we see them and we watch them succeed. And then we often say, you know, does anyone want to mentor a scholar? Does anyone want to run one of the cohorts? Does anyone want to, you know, do this project that we're thinking of doing? And, and people then come back and say, yeah, I'd, I'd actually really like to do that. I, this is how I've benefited. So therefore, I want to support um, the next group of scholars coming through. And, and we, we, we really, really value that because ultimately, um, those scholars are inspired by people that are very similar to them in terms of talent, right? Not in terms of everything else, but the talent is very similar. The, the ambition, the drive, the, the desire to make an impact is so similar. And so when people talk about like-minded individuals, what they really mean is that talent. That talent pool is so deep that basically we really encourage people to form those connections and keep those connections for the rest of their careers. Just a couple of other things that I want to focus on um, before we sort of bring the conversation to a close. And one of those is that I think it's quite interesting to notice the value to society that the the function of an organization like the Healthcare Leadership Academy is, is essentially it's matching all of these ambitious people to projects where they might actually get to do something. And that's something that isn't happening in the NHS. The NHS isn't making use of that pool of talent that is there. So you're needing an external organization who can be a sort of umbrella for all of those people who want to really make a bigger impact. Um, That's incredibly useful. Like, you know, we we should have been doing that a long time ago, uh, in in my view, because the the benefits to society are, are really, you know, potentially quite enormous. Zach, I'd, I'd, I'd challenge you in one respect, which is that the NHS isn't doing that. I think the NHS does a lot to support, um, mm. to, to try and try and do the right thing. I mean, I have never met, I, I have argued with a lot of NHS leadership people, right? They, they you know, yeah. about <laughs> various way, the ways of doing things or or whether this contract is needed or whether this, we need the interdisciplinary transfer system. Or, you know, I can give you a litany of, of, of disagreements that I may have on a policy perspective with yeah. individuals with, that in leadership roles. However, I have never, ever met someone in the health service that isn't desperate to do what we're describing, right? To innovate, to, to yeah. improve, to, to genuinely make a difference in society. And I say that actually also about the politicians I've met of all spectrums, right? That I've never met someone who 
at the at the at, down deep, I don't believe that they went into politics for the wrong reason. I think in general, people go to to do public service roles in order to try and help the society they're part of. Now, whether you agree with the way they do something, you know, whether you're on the uh, on the kind of Hayek end of the spectrum or or, or um, you're you're kind of more of a, a socialist, I think that's a, that's a different question, right? Whether you believe the mechanism is to is to use one mechanism over another, that's an argument yeah. that you can make on a policy in a policy scenario. But the motivation for people is is fairly clear. I think most people in the health service really want to see positive make a positive difference what they struggle with is how to do that and what i what i really struggle to Mm. what i see a lot is that often when they struggle when organizations struggle when individuals struggle they then come up with somewhat destructive ideas right so they become instead of instead of so they want to innovate. They want to improve the system themselves, but they're so affected by how much they can't that they become blockers to innovation from other sources. So they 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 yeah. re- they think they they have a kind of negative a- a- a reaction to success elsewhere, and so that and it's the then... silo mentality, <coughs> kind of what you're describing. Exactly, you know, you're so, and so and, and... contained in your own box. Yeah, exactly. And and what happens there is that when individuals then become blockers to other innovation or stifling to other silos, you end up with a really bad and corrosive culture. And, you know, the, 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 the often the biggest problems in organizations are the cultural ones, right? And when you're a small organization like the two organizations I run are, I mean, let's, let's be clear, we're very small organizations in the great scheme of things, right? You can build that culture from the beginning. You can build the culture you want to see. And for us, that culture is all about innovation and success and, mm-hmm. and driving to kind of an ethical and values-driven outcome, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're in a large organization that has baked into it a culture that is that has other that has more more problematic kind of barriers it's very hard to turn that organization around and mm-hmm. and i think often what you see in these large organizations like the health service itself is a desperate desire to see improvement and change but not having the tools or the foresight or the ideas or the or the uh, the ability to inspire to genuinely mm. shift that organization around and that's often what what where things are kind of falling short but i i would never ever question the desire that people have to see improvement because i've never met anyone in anything in mm. any of these organizations that doesn't want to make a difference and make an improvement i i think they just struggle to sometimes achieve i think that's very well said um what do you think is the best way to make a difference then i think you know if you were kind of at at my stage where would you be wanting to put your efforts because like you say there's a lot of things that you can get involved with these days you know you could be um you know a founder um of an organization you could be working for a health tech company you could be working as a professor in a university or you could just be a really really good consultant working in the nhs um trying to make the service at a local level as good as you can possibly make it i think don't get sucked up by what everyone else is doing don't get sucked into the the, into what everyone else is doing and and a kind of fomo or the grass is greener mentality right that just because someone else is doing something doesn't mean you have to do that i would say and this is a adv- piece of advice many of the scholars will have heard me say, look at what you want to achieve. Look at what what your ideal situation is, right? What's your ideal life story it, between the ages of 45 and 60? And, and I specifically ask people for that window, right? Because often when you're in your 20s, you are, <clears throat> or your th- early 30s, you are, you know, you're active, you're, you're, you've got huge amounts of drive and desire and all this stuff, and you have very little responsibilities, right? You don't have yeah. <laughs> kids and family and all those things. You can, you know, if you really chose to, you can go to the other side of the world and start working as, a, as whatever you want to work in. 
you don't, you know, at that point in your life, it's very, when people are asked to pick their careers at that stage, they often think about what happens in the next five years or the next 10 years. What would I like to do? The problem in healthcare is that these career arcs are not like in other fields, right? In other fields, you can change your job every five or seven years, et cetera. And it's almost expected that you, there will be a degree of movement, right? In medicine, yeah. you know, it takes you 20 years to get to the place you want to be. Now, if you start on a journey, journey that is not the the outcome you want to genuinely achieve or you don't think is going to make you happy in the period when you have children you have family you have you know other responsibilities then you're really stuck and the problem we see i see across healthcare is that you get people who've ended up in a situation where there are other constraints on them they have financial constraints on them yeah. they have family constraints on them they have responsibility constraints on them they have societal constraints on them and so they basically suddenly and that's where the unhappiness comes from the inability to do the amazing things they want to do because they're stuck in a silo where they they genuinely don't know how to get out of it because so many things hold them back and i think what they need what you need to do if you're someone that you're describing someone in a, as a young person thinking about where they want to go is look at that that period when you're about 45 to 60 what kind of life do you want to have what is your what are your what do you think your top priorities will be at that mm -hmm. stage is it going to be family is it going to be career is it going to be uh, wealth is it going to be you know what do you think will make you actually happy and mm -hmm. on the basis of that start making decisions early on right you don't have to be so strategic that you 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 end up actually you know stifling your own progress but you do need to think okay if i'm not going to be happy when i'm 50 with the life i'm setting myself up for then yeah. is it a good idea to do the things i'm doing and therefore then make some changes now the other thing, you know, how do you go about doing it? Go and talk to people, right? I mean, we have, you know, like I say, we have hundreds of scholars. We've got loads of people working in our organization. Many of them just come and they applied for something. They get involved. They do something, you know, then they, they discover a passion. They discover other passionate people. That's the other important thing. Work with people that you genuinely can be inspired by every single day. Because if you do that you will have a very rich life and a very rich career. And at the risk of sounding, making this podcast sound like a massive advertisement for the HLE, um, how can people get involved if they want, if they are listening to this and think, well, wow, this sounds great. I really want to get involved. Apply. I mean, it's very simple. There's, uh, there are, there are. We have an application process once a year for the HLA. We have uh, programs that we run monthly in Medics Academy, training and teaching, and various other programs. We have uh, our PG Cert that we run. Uh, I think applications are open twice a year. We have fellows programs. Uh, applications are open twice a year for that as well. Um, there are loads and loads of ways to get involved in any of the stuff that we do. Um, and I would just get involved i mean apply and get involved if you if you're interested in any of our work but more importantly if you just want to get involved and kind of and 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 you know take part in it then apply to one of the programs any of the programs and see what you can uh, do i think one of the things i do struggle with is that increasingly people try and like they try and come in through the side as it were they try and like kind of pitch yeah. in somewhere and I, I have to say that that doesn't work as well um in in this kind of setup because men most of our programs are highly competitive right they are very competitive to get into and that has other implications right so in general you know i, I would argue i would say talk to one of our you know one of the scholars one of the faculty one of our fellows any of the people in the network and see what it takes and then and then come through the tradition through the the process that we've put up because the process itself is very very specific so we design our recruitment processes very much to ensure that you will be successful if you succeed and we we can then legitimately invest in you the kind of resources because you're at the right stage in your journey. Yeah. And that's not the right stage in your career because we have people that are we've got, I think, a dean and a and a and consultants, et cetera, and the same pool as medical students. So we don't really care about where you are in your career, but you need to be in the right place in your intellectual and your personal yeah. journey to really make the most of the value of the of the opportunity. Yeah.
Now, my final question is always for a book recommendation. So, you know, I'm, um, it's coming up to Christmas time now. Uh, if people want to read more about what we've been talking about, you know, have you got anything they should ask Santa for? Okay, so if you're going to ask me about books, now, Zach, you know, I think I recently published this year's reading list that I put, and I think there were about 50 books on that reading list. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's very, uh, it, I, I mean, I, I am I am a prolific, or not so much reading, but I, I'm a prolific listener to audibles and uh, audible and, and podcasts and various other things, but mainly audible. So I, I listen to a huge uh, variety of, of work. And um they, uh, recently, we had I organised an away day, away cut of three days for our senior management team at Medics Academy. We took them away and uh, into uh, we took them to a country house and all this. And one of the things that we did was I made all of our senior managers listen to a book called Unleashed, uh, which was by a couple of American academics, and it really talked about leadership and and how um, you can think about that within an organisational structure. It's it's written by someone uh, by uh, two authors, Francis Frey and Anne Morris. Uh, Unleashed, and that was extremely extremely good but I've got a huge list of books which I think I published into the HLA uh, materials uh, recently um, and if anyone uh, wants to know any of the books I mean I think we put them often a lot of the unfortunately a lot of my uh, academic kind of our educational uh, 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 clinicians that are involved with Medics Academy and the HLA they will often get like randomly push to them like three books I'm reading at the time and say yeah hey, you should look at this <laughs> chapter or that chapter and so they probably have enough of that but right now I'm, I'm a lot of the work I'm reading is on um, interesting leadership and business uh, intellectual kind of capacity then uh, things around uh, artificial intelligence and 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 uh, how uh, the the innovation around like kind of space travel is going on so I've read quite a lot around that that recently which were, has been really interesting um, and then uh, a lot of historical uh, biographies uh, often about mm. individuals that are have taken up interesting roles and the, the difficulties they've been uh, sitting under the other book I would absolutely that I've, I'm literally I've just finished which I think is absolutely uh, brilliant is a book called Civilization by uh, Neil Ferguson is it Neil Ferguson I think it's Neil Ferguson people are thinking and, is that a book of the game Civilization they, they, no, no, no. It's, it's, so it's about too. Western no. civilization. So it's a book about Western <laughs> civilization. About the actually, to be fair, it, it, it talks about the about Western civilization, but in contrast to Roman, Chinese, and South American civilizations and the growth of them, and and also uh, civilizations across mm. the Islamic world and the different and and it's basically a historical text, right? It looks at yeah. the world as its development from pr pretty much from the uh, 16th century to the 21st century and the kind of socio-economic uh, development oh, it sounds like it'd be right up my street oh you definitely read it i mean i mean i, I if you if you're going to ask me about books i will literally spend i could spend hours just telling you about different <laughs> books i'm reading and why they're interesting and how they interact with each other uh, well, I wish you did have hours in the day to talk to us, Johan, but I know you're a very busy man. And, um, well, you know, it's, it's been great to have you on the podcast and thanks for your time. That's uh, right. So, yeah, right. thanks time. for being here. Pleasure. See you later. For listening. It's for listeners like you that I'm making this content and it would be amazing to have your support. The ways that you can support this podcast are leaving positive reviews on social media and subscribing if you're listening to this on YouTube. The more listeners like you who subscribe, the more I'll be able to improve the podcast and make better content for you to listen to. So if you like where this podcast is heading, please consider becoming a subscriber. I'll see you in the next episode.